I have often wondered about the formation of the solar system and outlined many problems with the accretion model. We've examined Alvin's modification and discussed how in the electric universe rocky bodies in the solar system are ejected by gas giants. One of my main problems with this concept is what drives the mechanism to cause the ejection. Often described as electrical stressing, but what exactly does that mean and why would it cause an ejection? Part of the mystery of our solar system are the chondritic meteorites. Their strangeness may indeed be the key to understanding the formation process of our solar system. While researching the Beano asteroid, I reached out to Wald to discuss the formation of meteorites in the electric universe, and he sent me across one of his older papers, which for me was a missing link and filled in the understanding of this ejection process, the creation of these meteorites, and possibly explaining some of the strange coincidences I mentioned in my last video. Let's explore Wall Thornhill's formation of chondritic meteorites and the solar system. Chondritic meteors are so named because they contain chondrules, or small spherules, of olivine, enstatite, and other meteoric elements. These are embedded in a matrix of similar material. These meteors can be found in four concentric zones within the asteroid belt, which yield four distinct types of chondritic meteorites. Each type contains materials that are not found in the other. They also contain what is called refractory inclusions, and this means that they are highly enriched with the least volatile or refractory elements like calcium and aluminium. These have characteristically thin shells surrounding them, which does not vary in thickness from sample to sample. All refractory inclusions appear to have suffered some flash heating event of unknown origin, and consequently show a complex chemistry and morphology. The high and low temperature components of chondrites are well mixed, generally as separate entities. They have not grown from the refractory core outwards to a less refractory rim. The chemistry of the components is complementary and must have originated in a closed system. The shell of the refractory inclusions matches the components inside, indicating it was formed from this material, not deposited by an external source. The shell is enriched by up to five times in those refractory elements and have a europium and ytterbium anomaly, which indicates that the inclusions have been strongly heated to about 1500 degrees Celsius and 80% of the surface layer sublimed away. The heating was brief, lasting less than 100 seconds as is evident by the sharp inner edge to the refractory inclusion shells and the fact that these cores are largely unaffected by the heat pulse. The retention of volatiles in the chondrules also indicates that the heating was of very short duration. This implies the zone of creation must have been very localised. The growth of refractory inclusions was interrupted while they were still at high temperatures. The chondrites that are the furthest from the sun contain the most refractory components, and this means that the solar radiation cannot be the cause of the heating for their formation. The cooling period probably took minutes to hours, and strangely they are almost all non-spherical. The core of the inclusion has an excess of heavy magnesium isotope, while the shell has normal magnesium isotope ratios. Some of the chondrules are compound chondrules and this indicates that there might have been collisions between molten chondrules. The current accepted theory for the formation of these chondritic meteorites is during the initial formation of the solar system. Dust and small grains were accreted to form these primary asteroids. The problem is that all of the mysteries that we've just discussed mean that at the moment there is no single theory that can explain all of these observations given this formation process. According to this scenario, comets, asteroids and meteorites all have a common origin. Professor S, and excuse me for my pronunciation, Vzek Skviatsky, director of the Kiev Observatory and head of the Faculty of Astronomy, University of Kiev, had concluded from his studies of the comets that celestial mechanics, the distribution and statistics of cometary orbits, and consideration of the kinematics of the cometary system leave no doubt whatsoever that all comets, and therefore the products of their decay, were formed inside the solar system, 
and were formed a little later than the planets were. The existence of the families of short period comets of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, and the peculiarities of their motion and nature, their chemistry, the presence of ice in their nuclei, their close association with Jupiter prior to the discovery demonstrates a region of origin of the comets. It would be easy to simply attribute these as comets that were captured, but Fred Whipple wrote in his book on the mysteries of comets, a plot of the orbits of the short period comets projected on the plane of Jupiter's orbits shows a remarkable clustering. The ring of the aphelion curves outlines Jupiter's orbit beautifully. The conclusion has been clear for more than a century. Jupiter's huge attractive mass has somehow collected two-thirds of all the short period comets into a family. When Voyager discovered that Jupiter had a faint ring system, it turned out that Zach Kwiatkowski had predicted the ring's existence as early as 1960 in a science journal and the passage from this paper is as follows. The existence of active ejection processes in the Jupiter system, demonstrated by comet astronomy, gives ground for the assumption that Jupiter is encircled by comets and meteorite material in the form of a ring similar to the rings of Saturn. It will sadly come as no surprise that his name is totally absent from any scientific literature relating to comets and planetary rings. So let's examine how the ejection process could cause these ejections. Dr. C. Bruce set out a number of laws concerning electric discharges, two of which are important for this discussion. Number one, the aggregation of atmospheric matter. Slow accumulation of electrical charges takes place in astronomical atmospheres and the subsequent relatively rapid electrical atmospheric discharges, similar to lightning, produce a magnetic field which compresses the channel of the current. When this occurs in a prolonged discharge, it causes aggregation of large volumes of thinly distributed gas and matter into relatively narrow channels. When the current dies away, the compressed gas expands and cools. Number two, the generation of gas jets. Variations in the discharge current or current density along the discharge channel will give rise to variations in the actual pressure and hence to a flow of gas. As both of these parameters will decrease outwards in atmospheric electrical discharges, it will give rise to gas jets. Following on Bruce's work, Eric W. Crew claims that the longitudinal voltage gradient acting on positive ions is probably an adequate mechanism for producing jets. He also suggested that large quantities of matter could be ejected from the solid or liquid cores of large gaseous planets, and this may also apply on a stellar and galactic scale. If we take the example of a gas giant, then we can see that the core can become highly positively charged by a gravitationally driven pressure, compressive ionization, forcing the electrons away from the atoms. The high temperature and pressure in the planet's core strips an outer electron or two from each atom, causing partial ionization of the core. The free electrons, which are much more mobile than the ions, will tend to migrate away from the high pressure region in the core towards the planetary surface, and some would be neutralized by positive charges from cosmic rays. This means the planet will acquire a net positive charge. Whilst it is at the center of the gaseous planet, the growth of the core in mass and pressure will cause its total charge and the voltage gradient at the core boundary to increase steadily. Only the high pressure of the unionized material surrounding the largely ionized core prevents an explosive expansion of the core but eventually a condition of breakdown may be attained. The increased pressure and temperature is likely to cause a sudden change of state, followed by a contraction and increase in spin of the core. The peripheral friction and turbulence would increase the local voltage gradient, and where it exceeds the breakdown value, there would be a radial discharge in the form of a flow of positive ions, creating discharge jets. Now we must also consider what happens to the electrons. Assuming that most will be surrounding the core, once the discharge begins, electrons under high pressure conditions will not be able to move rapidly enough from other parts of the planet to quench the outburst. In the low pressure regions of the planet's upper atmosphere, where the electrons are more free to move, 
the acceleration and recombination of electrons with positive ions in the region of the core discharge and probably also a cascade ionization process caused by encounters of relativistic electrons with atmospheric atoms would produce a planet-wide steep rise in radiation output. The planet or star would undergo a nova phase. Once the discharge starts, it would be self-sustaining, fed by the charge stored in the core until most of the charge is dissipated and the electric field in the discharge channel falls below a critical value. The stream of positive ions represents a massive flow of material out of the central region of the planet and a conversion of much of the charge energy into kinetic energy of the discharged matter. Some of the material at the head of the discharge channel would be discharged by free electrons in the surrounding medium, so the neutral material would cease to accelerate in the voltage gradient, causing the following material to pile up against it forming a steadily growing mass, proceeding to the outer regions of the planet's atmosphere and eventually emerging from the atmosphere. The ejected material would arc away from the planet. The variations of the velocity and position of the arc would cause material to go into different orbits. Some would be captured by the planet as a ring of debris and some would follow asteroidal orbits and other objects would become comets, meteorites and interplanetary dust. The arc of material leaving the parent would be composed of ionized gases, liquids and solids ranging in size from microns up to asteroids or planetoid dimensions. Electrical discharges would take place between the parent planet and the highly charged departing matter. These powerful plasma discharges would give rise to a number of effects. Number 1. Heating would be most intense along the axis of discharge falling off with radial distance from the axis. This might explain some of the chemical differences between the chondrites with refractory inclusions by varying degrees of vaporization of the precursor solids. Number two, at some distance from the discharge axis, low melting point minerals would melt to form chondrules, trapping relic grains and partially melted solids. Number three, Refractory inclusions would have their exterior surfaces evenly flash heated to temperatures of the order of thousands of degrees Celsius for the short period of the discharge. Number four, volatile elements would be preferentially vaporized in the discharge channel and accelerated along the discharge axis, causing some refractory and non-refractory elements to group into zones along the channel as well as radially. This would explain why some chondrites are rich in volatiles while others are depleted. The gaseous blast along the discharge channel would also deform cooling molten droplets, explaining why most chondrules are non-spherical. On quenching of the discharge, cooling would follow rapidly, in minutes giving rise to the sharp inner boundary between the refractory inclusion shell and its core. It is difficult to provide such rapid heating and cooling in an extended nebula cloud. When the discharge ceases, the magnetic pinch effect ceases, accompanied by an explosive fall in gas pressure, leading to the observed interruption of the growth of the chondrite's refractory inclusions, while still at high temperature. The electric discharge would also cause all the shells to be formed at the same instant under fairly uniform, highly localized conditions, thus giving rise to shells of a thickness that does not vary from one specimen to another. The magnetic pinch effect of the discharge will cause the dispersed material and gases to accelerate radially inwards towards the axis of the discharge, so that after the discharge is quenched there will be collisions of molten chondrules giving rise to the formation of compound chondrules and relict inclusions. Evidence of this electrical discharge may be found in the carbonaceous chondrites which have surprisingly large ancient magnetic field intensities. Such large electrical discharges would be of sufficient power to cause nucleosynthesis and cause the transmutation of elements and the formation of isotopes and radionuclides. Tom van Vlaanderen confirmed this by stating the presence of isotopic anomalies in the carbonaceous meteorites implies the action of nuclear processes, not just chemical ones. Meteorites exhibit many other isotopic anomalies, chief among them being the appearance of isotopes of xenon and iodine, 
which are known to be the decay products of relatively short-lived, heavy, radioactive parents. This presents problems for the conventional view and requires the formation of meteorites shortly after a stellar nuclear synthesis event, possibly the remnants of a supernova. Yet neither tectites nor meteorites have been found in ancient geological formations, which suggests that most surviving meteorites are relatively young. The electric discharge mechanism would render radiogenic dating meaningless. All giant planets in our solar system have ring systems, which by this theory are indicative of past expulsions of matter. Saturn's rings would appear to be the most recent. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.